This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. It's time for the Great Maryland Recipe Hunt. Join us on this week's PreserveCast as we talk with Joyce White from A Taste of History to discuss the upcoming anniversary of one of Maryland's most iconic cookbooks, Maryland's Way, the Hammond Harwood House Cookbook. This cookbook included recipes found in historic, handwritten journals, as well as many that were donated from Marylanders across the state. The Hammond Harwood House and the Maryland State Archives, along with Preservation Maryland, are teaming up to continue the search for recipes that fully represent Maryland's evolving cuisine to honor the 60th anniversary of the cookbook. This is Nick Gritting. You're listening to PreserveCast. We're excited to be talking with food historian Joyce White, um, who we've um, had a conversation with before, um, way back for those of you who listened on episode 96. We're like up into episode 250 something now. Um, but, uh, today we're going to be talking all about the great Maryland recipe hunt, which is a really cool idea, not only here in Maryland, but I think it has implications for people across the country who are interested in cultural history and getting people engaged. And there's no better way to get people engaged than around food and food history. So, um, welcome back, Joyce, for those who weren't, uh, didn't get a chance to listen to episode 96 and we'll put a link in the notes here so they can go back and kind of go in depth in your story. But, um, just a recap for those folks. Where did you grow up and how did you become a food historian? Um, and then we'll kind of jump into the hunt. Sure. Thanks, uh, Nicholas. So I grew up right outside New York City, about an hour north of the city. And um, I went to college further into New York, into central New York, in Geneva, New York. I went to Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And when I was there, I started to understand that uh, museums, uh, studies is something that I really wanted to learn more about and majored in American studies and did some internships in order to complete that major. And the the first time I ever cooked in front of a hearth was during one of these internships. And I had to cook a cake with the entire fourth grade population of the county uh, where, where I was uh, living at the time. And I had to actually do it in an 1840s farmhouse using a fire and dressed in 1840s garb and had to pretend that I was living in the 1840s. So it was a real uh, new experience for me because I had never built a fire. I had never even had a fireplace in my house. So I had to learn on the job, as as they say. And uh, some, some days were better than others. Some days we had some disasters. Some days uh, or most days were great. And I did that for... Uh, the spring of 89. And then I went back again in uh, the following year, just before I graduated and did it again and really learned a lot about uh, food history and the, and the, the different processes that are involved in just doing something as simple as baking a cake, something we take for granted uh, today is something simple. We can, you know, simple as opening a box and pouring things into a bowl and mixing a couple of ingredients into it and putting it into our, you know, powered ovens. Um, it's a very different prospect uh, in the pre-modern days. Uh, it takes a lot more effort, a lot more skill, and uh, a lot more patience. And, and um, honestly, and experience, too, really helps with that. And you work at a pretty cool historic site, just for people listening um, who might want to look it up. Tell about where you work, and then also the, the site that you volunteer at a lot in Annapolis. Well, yeah, so I, I'm the food historian at Riversdale House Museum in Prince George's County. It was the home of uh, George and Rosalie Calvert. So you may have heard of Rosalie Calvert, uh, sometimes referred to as the mistress of Riversdale. Uh, there's a book about her and the letters she wrote back and forth to her family who lived in Antwerp. And I won't go into her whole history right now, but it's a very fascinating history. And I started out there in 2006 as their museum educator. And then decided to take a back seat and just do food history because I was doing a lot of food history anyway and decided that that's really what I wanted to focus on. So ever since then, uh, I, I am considered a part-time seasonal employee there and, and work as needed. And then I've had lots of time to do other projects, including volunteering at the Hammond Harwood House Museum in Annapolis, where I live. And I am on the board of trustees there. I'm currently the vice president. So I, I get to go to lots of different museums now as a consulting food historian. And so that is just one of the, the, the sites uh, among others. 
Yeah, I think you have one of the one of the coolest um, jobs in in preservation history in the state. I think <laughs> I think it's pretty neat. I'm pretty jealous of it. So you've also come up, you know, because you're just I guess you don't you don't have enough crazy things to keep yourself busy with. You've got this other amazing idea that you got you have launched in partnership with a bunch of other folks, and I want to talk about it. Obviously, for people here in Maryland listening, it's a great um, opportunity for them to get engaged. But I also think that, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of really good lessons in here for people all across the country who are looking at engaging people around cultural history and food history. And, and it's such what an evocative way of getting people engaged in history. So it's called the Great Maryland Recipe Hunt, which is a project by the Hammond Harwood House uh, and the Maryland State Archives. So... Talk us through it. Where, where, sure. What's the idea? Where did the idea come from? What well, is the idea? It? Actually, what are we trying hatched, to do here? Yeah, the idea hatched in uh, late 2019 when I was doing research at the Maryland State Archives and submitted uh, a question that the the, the arch- archivists who were up front couldn't answer, so they sent it back to their more senior archivists and. The uh, woman who was back there, who who answered the question, came out to see me because she recognized my name because I worked with her when I was doing a consulting job at the Peca House in Annapolis, the 18th century home of the signer, William Peca, signer of the Declaration of Independence, I should say. And she came out because she wanted to say hello. And we just started chatting and we talked about how important it is to collect food history traditions and recipes today for future generations. And so we ha- and this is, of course, before COVID, before Zoom became a big, uh, you know, popular uh, thing to do. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a couple of days where we could open up the archives and ask people to bring their recipes and their memories of food um, dining experiences in Maryland so that we could document them for the future? And so we planned to do this. And then uh, the archives had to cancel because uh, they had overcommitted themselves. So we tabled it for the spring of 2020, which of course never was able to happen. What happened then? What happened then, right? (laughs) (laughs) The whole world came to an end. And so then uh, once the world started opening up again, uh, the archives opened up again, I reached out to uh, Maria, her name is Maria Day, and we decided that it'd be a good time to, you know, revive this, this project. And I also, as the uh, on the board of trustees at the Hammond Harwood House, had always been very fascinated with the Hammond Harwood House cookbook that was published in 1963 called Maryland's Way. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to honor the upcoming 60th anniversary of the publication of that book, because it is one of the most iconic cookbooks published in the 20th century on Maryland food waste. And it's... Um, I was doing some research and I found out that within the first 20 years of its publications, it sold over a hundred thousand copies. Which is a lot for a lot for a a local cookbook. That's got to be, I mean, that's probably one of the best selling cookbooks in Maryland history, right? I I think it must be. Um, And then I found a reference to the fact that um, um, an Anglophile in 1981, I guess it was when our, you know, the current King Charles was married to Princess Diana. Uh, they, uh, this person from Maryland sent a copy of the book as a wedding present to the royal family, which I found fascinating. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be a great opportunity to honor the publication of that book with a, a new revived call for recipes, essentially. And and, right. food. and that book for people who, I mean, you maybe you'll talk about it, but that book for people, I have a copy of it. We sent a copy to our friends at Kiplin Hall, so they have a copy in their library. But that book, that version of it um, is very um, uh, dominant culture focused. There's not a whole lot of references to different communities and different ethnicities and cultures. And I know that that's a big focus of this one, which I think is really cool because like Maryland has, Maryland wasn't, let's be honest, what was portrayed in that book. There were people of different cultures and and backgrounds at that time, but Maryland is is even more different today. And that should be reflected in the recipes, which I know is a focus of what you're hoping to accomplish. Exactly. So the recipe hunt, it's also, there's sort of a, there's two things going on here. So we have the, the recipe hunt, which is definitely geared to collecting any and all recipes, whether they're old traditional ones or new traditions that uh, new immigrant groups have brought to this country, um, 
you know, we want it all. We want it all for future generations, all those references. You know, we take for granted the foods that we eat and when we eat them and why we eat them and what cultures they come from. Um, but people in 100 or 200 years, might it might not be that obvious to them um, that we eat, you know, tacos regularly or enchiladas or uh, Venezuelan ayacas and all of these other foods that are um, incredibly diverse in this state, even in the um, Rockville area. I believe there's a lot of Ethiopian um, foods uh, and traditions there. So, so that's one part of the project is to document this diversity for future, the future. The other part of the project, which is a little bit separate from the recipe hunt itself, um, but it's another way to kind of honor the 60th anniversary of the publication of the Maryland's Way cookbook is to, to take that cookbook and, and do exactly what you said, kind of re- reevaluate it in today's terms. You know, what do we see in that book that is reflective of Native American tradition? What's reflective of African American? Um, even German and Jewish traditions are uh, really, part of Maryland's earlier foundational cuisine. And so to reevaluate that book and look at that book and put Maryland's early cuisine in context of, of all of that diversity that is in the Maryland's Way cookbook, but not acknowledged. Right. And so are you actually hoping to reprint it? So the, the cookbook is still in publication. So, um, you know, we order them as needed. So it's still being reprinted. So, But that book is going to stay the same. So this new book that we're creating, hopefully in 2024, that's the goal, will be a companion book to that. So it's not going to be a reprint of all the recipes. It's going to be a, a an analysis of what's in there in terms of diversity. And it's going to include some very much needed, I think, uh, modern recipe adaptations of some of those recipes because they were written in a way that is, um, for the modern cook, very difficult to follow. Some of them were written in 1963, you know, 1950s, 1960s style, and those are still difficult to follow. But a lot of the recipes in that book were taken from, you know, handwritten documents dating back to the 18th and 19th centuries, and those are really hard to follow. So, you know, I plan to rewrite many of those recipes so modern cooks can can use them and, uh, you know, give life back to them in in, uh, honoring our traditions. So the companion book, it'll have a little it sounds like it'll probably have a mixture. You know, have some of the historic ones and some of the the new things that you find. Um, What's going to what's going to sneak through? Like what's like on your top three list of like, okay, these historic recipes have to get into the new one. Sure. Well, I think it's it's really important to um, to include uh, some of the content from the recipe hunt, and I, I plan to do that. Um, mainly for me, it's not the recipes that are are just important; it's the stories behind the food, why we eat these foods, when we eat them. So I, I'm hoping to take elements from the recipe hunt that might include, um, you know, traditions. Like I have one submission that talks about her family's um, annual tradition of eat, picking crab on the porch of uh, a house in Calvert County overlooking the water and the, the ritual they go through with the different uh, seasonings and toppings and, you know, dips that they have for picking the crab. And then the leftover crab meat gets turned into a crab dip. Um, so that might be like an as a, a little vignette to talk about how these traditions are still present in our cuisine today. Right. But um the focus is going to be on, you know, giving people a recipe that they can, that, as I said before, is that they can use that's modern. And it may be a conglomeration of se- several different recipes. And, you know, here's a redaction that you can use in your kitchen today based on old recipes and maybe some new, more modern versions. Um, the three things that I, I would definitely include, obviously, we'd have to include Chesapeake seafood. Um, so, you know, crabs, yeah. oysters. Uh, terrapin even that's important there there are recipes for that must can you make ter- i know you can make mock terrapin mm-hmm. you yeah, make- mock ter- have you eaten real terrapin i have no, not re- it's not okay. something i i would i would want to do it's technically illegal uh to it's actually uh, so trade in terrapin yeah you can i think i believe you can and i could be wrong but i believe if you trap your own 
you can you can use them for food, but you can't sell them. I believe that a law was passed hmm. not that long ago, like maybe 2006 or 2008. Okay. Making that illegal. Um, so no, I, I won't be, but I have done the, the mock terrapin and the mock, uh, in terms of the soup. Um, but and you for can people make, listening around the country who aren't following along, terrapin is turtle. Yes. 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 And you can do, so there were many recipes for mock terrapin and or turtle soups. And the thing that you use to make the, um, soup taste like terrapin is a calf's head. Right. So also slightly challenging. To Which procure. I've done that. <laughs> yes, I think last time we had you, you talked about some type of gel- gelatinous thing that you make in a calf's head and you scoop it out or something like that. Well, you, <laughs> what happens is after you boil down the, the calf's head, you pick off all the meat and you chop up the tongue and then you you put it in a dish and you press it between two plates and you weight it down. And what happens is it will form into a like a cube, a large cube that you then dice up. And th- that is what looks like the turtle or terrapin meat and tastes like it. Uh, veal supposedly tastes like turtle, terrapin. There so you go. Well, I'll have we, to take I their apologize. word for it. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for not giving people the warning about the calf's head uh, <laughs> recipe we'd be receiving here. So, so Maryland seafood. What else is going to be in there? You know, beaten biscuits. What are, What is your go? to Biscuits are absolute. So, there's uh, breads were really important in um, studying Maryland's food history because it, it has a, such wider implications too for the economy, um, the use of enslaved labor, and um, you know, the fact that the, the cash crop was this all very, very labor intensive uh, tobacco crop. So when settlers first uh, arrived in Maryland and decided they wanted to grow tobacco, they needed a cereal grain that could sustain them, but uh, wasn't too involved, didn't require a huge amount of work. And, and part of the work of, of growing cereal grains would be clearing the fields. And when the settlers arrived here and learned from the, the local, you know, indigenous people about Indian corn, they realized they didn't have to clear clear, or clear their fields the way they would for wheat, because all you had to do was girdle the trees, and then the leaves would not uh, be able to grow, you know, kind of kill off the, the growth. And that way the sun could stream down through. So you didn't have to do anything else. You just had to literally go to each tree and mar the, the side of it, like cut a notch into the sides of it so that the sap couldn't flow up into the, the leaves to, to provide the food for the leaves. And then you would sow your corn, uh, you know, you'd clear some of the land there. You'd sow the corn um, in hills. And it, it pollinates with the wind. So you kind of want to scatter them around in different areas. And um, it, it just made life a lot easier. One man could sow enough corn to feed his family for a year by himself, which was different from wheat. Wheat was a lot more um, labor intensive. And mm-hmm. the bigger, the even more important issue here is that wheat and tobacco have to be harvested roughly around the same time. So it doesn't make sense to have a crop that you have absolutely have to get in at the same time you absolutely have to get your tobacco in. Whereas right. corn is uh, improves if you leave it in the field to dry out and, and cure and mature because you want to be able to save it for the year. And the best way to do that is to dry it out. You can't do that with wheat. Wheat's a very different prospect. So it really made a lot of sense. So pretty much all the early settlers grew Indian corn as their main cereal grain and grew some small quantities of wheat just so that they could have their beloved, you know, British pastries, their pies and cakes and things like that. Um, Over time, of course, that changed by the middle of the 18th century. We then started to turn away from tobacco and start to grow wheat more. There were a lot of issues going on in Europe with the price of wheat and the shortages of wheat. And so now, finally, for the first time, growing wheat was a, a more financial, uh, financially stable prospect than growing tobacco. So a lot of wheat, uh, or a lot of farms, rather, turned their fields over to growing wheat. And then subsequently, a lot of the... Um, mills opened along the, you know, the Jones Falls and all those areas around Baltimore, Ellicott Mills and 
all that to process all this wheat. They were called merchant mills. So rather than a small, you know, um, mill house where you have stone ground uh, mill uh, or millstones, this is a little different. This is much more mechanized um, by the 1800s. So. Uh, so it really starts to, to blossom as industrialization occurs. And then so then Baltimore becomes this booming uh, center by the 19th century and things change. So now wheat becomes more available. So instead of having corn based breads, now you're starting to have wheat based breads more, more you know, frequently. And one of the, the ways that you can make biscuits without using yeast is by beating the dough. So you're beating the dough to disintegrate the gluten, but also to add air into the, the, the recipe. So it lightens a little bit as it, as it cooks. Now, this isn't the same kind of a biscuit that you would get at, you know, a country breakfast spot today with a nice buttermilk biscuit that's light and flaky made with baking powder. This is much more like, uh, almost like a, oyster cracker in a way, a larger oyster cracker. It it's it's bigger, it's not quite as crunchy. It's, you know, it's it's definitely more like bread, but it's it is definitely not like a buttermilk biscuit. Um, and you can eat them with uh, you know slices of ham or with jam or apple butter or any anything like that. Um, uh, but but you've got the thing that you've got to do with these biscuits and something that got lost through the mists of time is you have to use the kind of wheat that they were growing. Uh, you know, 150, 200 years ago, so that they stay soft and tender. And that's uh, a soft winter wheat as opposed to a hard red wheat, which is what most are made with or were made with in the 20th century. And then they, they turn into hockey pucks. <laughs> and I think that this this little uh, beaten biscuit interlude is cool because it gives people a sense for around the country too, who have stories like this in regional cuisines is how you can connect place and history and agriculture and, you know, the history of labor and enslaved people and whatever that might be back to a recipe. So exactly. it starts the with a recipe. Is so much more. The recipe it, is the jumping off point. And that's, and I, that's why, uh, you know, we're, we're not here to talk about beaten biscuits, but I wanted to let you go down that road. Um, first, because I saw you light up when I mentioned beaten biscuits. And then um, because I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's really important for people to hear that. And for, preservation groups and historical societies and museums to think about using food as a way of kind of telling a, a broader story. And there's so much in food too, right? It's a STEM activity because, you know, if kids are doing it, there's math associated with it and it's basically chemistry and it's, you know, there's an artistic component to it as well. It's, it's this interesting connection and there's something very visceral about eating something, right? You get, you get to enjoy something at the end. So, um, why don't we take a quick break here, come back and talk about how people are going to be giving you their information, how people listening could provide information, um, the webinar that's coming up and uh, all that good stuff. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Super excited to be talking to Joyce White, food historian um, who is also working on the Great Maryland Recipe Hunt. And so before we took our break, we're talking all about sort of how this came about, the idea of this great cookbook and sort of updating it, having a companion piece to it that's updated with stories and recipes of all of Maryland's rich culture um, and communities from across the state. So if people are listening and there are Marylanders listening or, uh, you know, expat Marylanders listening to us from somewhere else in the country and they have great um, Maryland recipes, how are you collecting them and what will be done with them? So we are using a website. And you can go to it at www.marylandrecipes.org. And on that website is a page for submissions. And that's where you can submit your recipe. Or if you don't have the recipe, if you just know a particular food was popular in your family, maybe you don't have the recipe anymore. Or if you have, you've been to somebody's house and you had a great meal there and you know that it was um you know, many of the ingredients were very local to the Maryland um, region. You can just tell us about it, you know, tell us about the meal. It doesn't have to just be the recipe. It can just be a memory so that we know the context in which these foods were eaten, because that's really the the, the heart of, of, you know, a food is, is the 
the wider um, implications for our uh, how it reaches our you know our soul in a way, and it provides us with these cherished memories. And so all that is is very much welcome. And so on that website, you can you can submit as many recipes as you like, as many memories as you like. We are offering weekly themes, uh, but you don't have to follow them at all. And th- those are posted on our Facebook page, the Great Maryland Recipe Hunt Facebook page. And many of our partner sites, we've, we've been able to partner with uh, historic museum sites throughout the, the state who are helping to spread the word. And that's what the partnership is. There's no financial, um, you know, requirement to be a partner. So any, anyone listening to this who, you know, works at a historic site or has contacts with a historic site and would like to partner, uh, we're more than welcome to have as many partners as we can. And I'd like to see more representation from the Western portions of Maryland that seems to have um, been harder to reach Um, because there's such a rich tradition out there. We have, you know, the mountainous regions grow different crops. You know, corn uh, was not quite as popular as dairy. Dairy, you know, agriculture is big out there, was and still is. Beans and potatoes and things like that have also, um, you know, really rich tradition out in the western portions of the state and areas like Frederick, where you have a large Pennsylvania German population. We'd love to see recipes coming in from that uh, quarter of the world, too. So, and there are a couple in the Maryland's White Cookbook, um, but I'd like to see more. And I don't just mean Amish or Mennonite. I mean Pennsylvania German, uh, which is the wider group of a uh, band of Protestant Germans who settled in that region in the late 18th, well, the late 17th century, really. Um, but then it, it continued to grow in the 18th century. So that's really important, too. So you've also got a webinar coming up. When's the webinar happening and what's going to happen on that? Yeah, so the webinar is being hosted by one of our partner sites. It's at the Laurel Historical Society. They're they're hosting it. It's all, all going to be obviously on Zoom. And it is on a Thursday, November 10th at 7 p.m. And I'm hoping uh, to have a... Uh, uh, Kara Harris, who runs Old Line Plate. She's also part of this project. We've had her on several times. She's lovely. Um, she's great. Yeah, we and, love her. Um, we, we hope to have her. She's she's almost sure she can attend that. So I hope to do that. And Ann Bennett, who's the director of the Laurel Historical Society, she's running the, the webinar. So I'm not sure what else she has up her sleeve uh, for that night. But um, I'm thrilled to be part of it and to have been asked um, you know, to, to, to do this uh, webinar on the Maryland recipe hunt. Um, I find uh, it's important to reach out to people in this way. Social media is great, but it's nice to have a one-on-one. Uh, I'm also going to be attending the Oyster Fest in St. Michael's on October 29th. And I'm going to have a table there and my computer and my scanner. So if anyone happens to be uh, going to that event, uh, you're more than welcome to stop by and say hello and give us some information. We're also going to have some gift bags uh, for the first 12 people who uh, either submit their recipes before the event and are going to be at the event and they can go on to um, the MarylandRecipes.org, submit their recipe and just say, hey, I'm going to be at the Oyster Fest. I'll stop by so I can get my gift bag. You know, if you're one of the first 12, um, you know, that would be great. And it's just some fun Maryland food related items in the gift bags. And how long will the hunt be open for? Yeah, so the hunt is going to run for a whole year. We started September 1st and we're going to run it through August of 2023. We thought a year would be plenty of time to give people a chance to collect their recipes. And we even had we have a family who found uh, who have a manuscript or handwritten recipe book uh, that's been in their family since the 1840s. Um, from the Southern Anne Arundel County region. And they met with me at Hammond Harwood House and we scanned the book and I've transcribed the whole thing already. And, um, you know, that's going to be donated, I believe, to the the Maryland State Archives, the actual manuscript itself, because it's falling apart and tear. Yeah, well, this is super exciting to see that kind of happen. And that's a good other kind of reminder for people that stuff comes out of people's attics and you actually start saving actual documents and real things not just memories and and what people like and sort of the cultural aspect of this, but there's actually real documents that sometimes pop up, um, not surprisingly. Um, so um, 
are you uh, people are interested in learning more about you? Are you teaching any classes coming up? What what's what, what's what's cooking? Uh, I didn't even mean to say it that way, but what's cooking with you, Joyce? Yeah, so I do most of my presentations now. I prefer to do on Zoom. Um, it's just easier. I get it, you get better attendance, and I don't have to drive anywhere, which is nice. Um, so I, you know, I'm open to booking for anyone who who wants to book something for their organization or even for their private family or friends. I've done those too, which is really fun. Um, I've got a couple of classes coming up that I'm teaching in the um, Lifelong Learning Center through Montgomery College. Those will be in, I believe I'm doing two in spring. Uh, I think, I think we're doing, we're, we're in the process of, of figuring this out right now. I wish I could give you more definites, but one will be on dining with Jane Austen. And I think we're doing the taste of Maryland again. And then in the summer, we'll be doing another course too, but that none of that's been decided yet. And where people, where can people find all the information about you? Do you got a website or Twitter? Yeah, I have a website. Should... It's a taste of history dot net. Um, but I also, the other more, the more recent upcoming program I'm doing through Hammond Harwood house is my uh, Thanksgiving program. It's a history of the holiday itself, including food. So it's not just food, but it's a history of how the holiday evolved from the early 17th century, um, up through to the 1940s. Fascinating. I think a lot of people listening would be interested in that. And, uh, Good time to kind of share that information. Well, this is exciting. We'll make sure that there's links in the show notes so that people can um, submit their recipes, learn how this works. If they're elsewhere in the country and thinking about doing it themselves, they can take a look at the website and see how you've done it and maybe create one for their own community. Um, It's so much fun having you on. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation, and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.